Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. Welcome. If you want to stand, you can do. If you want to sit, you also can do. And we're going to read, maybe. I guess that one's got a problem this morning. Anyway, we're going to read Psalm 25 over on this side, my right. If you want to read off that one, you can. But you need to know Psalm 25 by heart. Which I don't. So here we go. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love.
that spirit helps us and comes to us and God pursues us because he's always pursuing us we see to surrender is peace and to ask forgiveness is peace and it helps us so let's do that now as we read our confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. And as we receive this forgiveness, the glory begins to fill our soul. We realize that God really does love us and there is peace to be had and it fills us. So the peace of the Lord be always with you Turn to a neighbor, share that peace that God has given us. puts it, these are invitations to be a part of something together. And so um, the first thing that we want to let you know that is coming up is um, there is a flyer out in the lobby that you can grab. This is for um, sort of a relaunch or a new launch, I should say, of something we're calling Men's Collective, which is simply like a series of just opportunities to engage at different levels. So like there's a fire pit this weekend, which is just super relational, organic, no agenda. And then there's all these men's groups we have going on. 
um, that have been launched or are in the process of being launched on Mondays, Wednesdays. There's a Friday morning breakfast that's going to be talked about a little bit that starts March 1st. Anyway, there's just a lot of opportunities to engage. And of course, um, a men's retreat that we've been talking about. And there's a lot of stuff Turner wanted me to let you know. Um, a lot of stuff coming for women as well. It just happens that this season, there's a lot of action around men's ministry uh, that's about to be launched. And so um, anyways, that being said, um, stay tuned. And we just, we want you to feel like this is a place where you belong and can become. Um, and so that being said, also Father Daughter Dance is coming up March 1st. It's a fiesta. <laughs> Weldon will be there. It's going to be great. Um, I hope that you plan on coming to that, grandparents or dads or caregivers, whatever. We'd love to just dance together and, uh, and do that in community. Um, and last, intro to St. Peter's. Uh, this is a time for um, many of you who have sort of stepped into this church and are wondering about Anglicanism or are wondering about um, what the values are of this community, how this whole thing works, how our structure works, how our mission works, how our budget works, what it is that we truly believe. Um, these are really great conversations to have. And so I host this. It's a lunch. Our staff will be there as well. And it's just really a great time to sort of step a little bit further into the life of the community. And so um, if that's where you are and you want to do that, we would love to have you. Um, be sure to RSVP. Um, you'll see that info at stpeters.me there just so we can make sure we have enough food um, for everybody. Uh, and last... Um, Last week, I talked about um, just the official starting line for every square inch as we move forward in this really dream about this property and the original vision that was cast here and wanting to pick up the baton and continue to run with that. So um, if you weren't here last week, I would just encourage you to go back and listen to what that looks like and what that means and all the updates that we've made uh, since we started talking about this as an idea last year and as it's coming into materialize. We're really excited and holding it with a lot of discernment and prayer. And so we'd love for you to do that with us. We'd love for you to give with us um, and whatever God puts on your heart. All that and more you can find on our website, also our app. And um, I'd love to invite our reader up to read our text this morning. Our Old Testament reading comes from Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. Our teaching text comes from Luke 15. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord. Well, I hope you've had a great weekend. This is the beginning of Lent, and um, there is... A few retreats going on as we speak. First of all, our students are away at their winter retreat in West Virginia. And um, many of you uh, have a connection to a student being away. And so I've seen pictures. They're alive. They're okay. Uh, they've been feasting on fast food. So uh, be ready for their, their comeback return on Monday, late night. Should be interesting. Um, now, Eric's just done such a great um, job with just such an incredible group of leaders that are really shepherding um, this next generation and raising them in the way of Jesus. And so um, just to encourage you to keep praying for them. I also was leading a contemplative retreat. I've just rolled in from Epkin Abbey. Um, and every year, I, I used to lead a lot of contemplative retreats. It's like something that I, I really love to do. And so we're going to continue to do that um, as the monks give us um, the guest houses to, to utilize and to uh, learn to pray 
through stillness and silence and solitude. And so um, I come to you today sort of uh, really relaxed. So, so if, uh, if I feel a little bit more chill than normal, well, that's just the effect of Mepkin Abbey. So the monks have that effect on us. Um, Lent is a season that we've, we're, we've just begun. Ash Wednesday was this past Wednesday. Just an amazing time together. The Holy Spirit just really ministered to us here in a way that was beautiful and um, tons of light. Um, but Lent is a season of reflecting. It's a season of repenting. It's a season of, of reorienting. It's, it's, I, I would call Lent a season of noticing. So much of life is so fast. You know, Advent, we just want to get to Christmas. Lent, we just want to get to Easter. You know, winter, we just want to get to spring. And, and there's just this sense of Lent wanting to sort of pull us back and to notice, to see what is happening in life. You know, when, when the scripture talks about repenting, you know, some of us come from traditions where that has a bit of a negative or shameful sort of connotation. And I get that. Repentance in the scripture is, is about turning to be on the path of life. That's the idea. It's, it's not to like accuse and shut you down and punish. It's to restore you to the path that actually brings life and to become aware of all the seductions that lead us down trails that have no good news for our soul in the end. And so Lent is really designed to orient us toward that so that on Easter morning, we, in some sense, are, are full of God's presence and can celebrate that death has no grip on us in the end. It's an amazing thing. And so it's a journey that we want to call you to. And in that journey, there's a series that we're doing. Um, we've just come out of a series on spiritual practices. And this particular conversation that we want to invite you uh, to be with us in on for the next six weeks is what we're calling the curiosity of God. And it's really questions that God asks us. I know a lot of us have questions for God. A lot of us have questions about God. A lot of us have mysteries that we're still wrestling with. But the reality of it is, so much of Scripture, God is actually asking us questions. And I think it would be really helpful and interesting to look at the questions that God is interested in asking us and to really name what those are. And so every single week for the next six weeks, we're going to look at a question that God is posing, not just to one sort of slice of a person that lived, you know, 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, but questions that are ongoing that God is still asking us today. And so we're going to talk about that in that first question today, but I just want to sort of tee up this whole conversation with this crazy statistic. In the Gospels, how many questions is Jesus asked? How many of you would say at least 50? We have at least 50. How many of you would say at least 100? At least 150? At least 200 questions? It turns out in the gospel, we have 180 questions that was posed to Jesus. And that's not surprising. Like, I, I, I've had a lot of conversations with people like, hey, as soon as I get to heaven or whatever that means, like, I want to ask God about this or about that, right? Like, we have questions that we want to engage God about, and that's good. Now, if there's 187 questions that we ask Jesus in the gospels, how many questions do you think Jesus asked us? 187 was on our side. In the Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions. That Jesus comes to us with curiosity. Jesus comes to us wanting us to, in some sense, find ourselves, to ask ourselves, to wrestle. And over the next six weeks through Scripture, I want to help us see that God is deeply curious about your life. I know some of us have not received messages of that over time. It's get your theology right, get your act together, shape up, whatever. I'm not saying there's no room for that conversation. I'm just saying that God has a sense of curiosity about who you are and who you're becoming and where you're going. That that's not like God isn't somewhere distant, sort of absent from engagement with you. And so I think questions like, you know, how, how does God, God asks us to become deeply curious about our own lives. I think that's one of the reasons why he asks us these questions. Think of it like this. There's a, a rabbi that passed away last year named Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He was in London. Incredible rabbi, incredible man of the Old Testament. And, and, and Judaism, which by the way is the community from which both the Old and the New Testament comes from, in Judaism, 
To be without questions, he says, is not a sign of faith, but a lack of depth. To be without curiosity in your own faith is not a sign of faith, but a lack of depth. Many of the customs, take the Seder night, for example, you know, where they dip the parsley and they remove the Seder plates. There are two examples. A lot of the customs we see in Judaism that are kind of like weird, the reason that they were given in the first place is so that we would be provoked with the question, why? So that we can then answer what it is God is doing. That's what the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says. Well, there's a Nobel Prize winning Jewish physicist named Isadora Rabbi, and she once explained to, to, to her mother about how she became a scientist. And what was said was that every other child would come back from school and be asked, what did you learn today? But my mother used to ask me instead, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? Because, like, questions mean engagement. Questions are about, like, you don't ask questions if you're not curious, if you're not engaged, if you're not somehow present. Like, we all remember this scene from Ferris Bueller, right? Remember, like, Bueller, do you remember this scene? If you haven't, like, that's, that's your spiritual practice today. Go watch Ferris Bueller. Or go remember Ferris Bueller, watch it again. And you can see, like, the students that are just there. There's, 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 not, like, there's not a lot of curiosity in this class, right? This guy in the bottom just woke up and he's drooling. This sense of, like, th- this is what it, it feels like to, to be in school, particularly under that teacher. And I think... I think what happens with questions in the scripture is that we see that God is nothing like this looking at your life. Like God is asking lots and lots of questions. And maybe if you're like me, well, it's like, well, he knows all things. So the obvious question is why? Why does God, why does Jesus come in flesh and ask us more questions than we can ask him? One of the reasons that Trevor Hudson, an author, poses to us is that first and foremost, I think it's this reminder that what God is after with us more than anything is a relationship. And like, don't let that go into like a, a category of like, I don't know, whatever your upbringing is. Of, I, I think more than anything, just cutting through any cultural thing you've come from. I think I would say as the pastor of St. Peter's, God, God really loves you. And God really wants to cultivate intimacy with you. And if we miss that, we miss everything. And somehow through the generations, we've missed that. I think the second thing that questions sort of get at with God in us is this idea of dignity that God is really secure to let you wrestle with all sorts of questions rather than settling for like easy answers. And he's given you a mind and he's given you emotions that you are a soul and that God has empowered you to search and you don't need to solve the equation like tonight. Like, you have this journey called life where the relationship we have with God is an invitation to explore and to question and to to wrestle, to struggle. The name of Israel means what? It means struggle. The very community that God created wasn't called the answer. It was called, we are going to wrestle with what it means to pursue God through the course of our life. And this God asks you questions in order for you to wrestle and struggle, in order for you to have dignity, that you are free as a, as a being to pursue God and to have a kind of dignity where God takes you seriously. And the last thing that, that Trevor talks about is this idea of formation, that questions have greater power to shape us than answers. Like, you know this because if you were a kid like me, when there was a time where you were cramming answers to the test on the way to school that you forgot by the time you came home. Like theology isn't about cramming the answers for the test because God's gonna be keeping score and, and like the test is due pretty soon. Like the nature of faith is that 
that we're on this sort of journey asking questions and that we're not just trying to like check boxes and fill in blanks. It's this idea that God wants us to sit and to wrestle and to struggle and to be formed through that process. Frederick Bigner says it like this. This hangs in my office. I've quoted it before. One life on this earth is all we get. Whether it's enough or not enough, and the obvious conclusion would seem to be that at the very least we are fools if we do not live it as fully and bravely and beautifully as we can. That God asks us questions in the Bible because he doesn't want us to phone it in. But to live in deep awareness of who we are. On page three in the Bible, we run into the first question God asks us. I want you to imagine, of all the types of ways, if you've been through English 101, you know how sentence structure works and how questions sort of are launched. I want you to wonder which of these is the first question God asks us. Genesis 3. Does he ask us, what have you done? Does he ask us, when did you leave the garden? Or maybe the first question was, how did you know you were naked? Or maybe the first question was, where are you? Or maybe the first question was, who's responsible for this? Or maybe the first question is, which of you ate first? Or was the first question, why so serious? Or perhaps, got milk. Where are you? First question we see in the scripture. After he's done all this creation, all this beauty, that you were the pinnacle of all creation. He asks us, where are you? Text goes like this. Now, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the woman, they, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden and Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. In Genesis 3, God's not lost track of us. The question isn't about geography. The question is about identity, that we lose track of ourselves throughout the course of life. And that's not like, well, I prayed when I was 13, so I'm good. Throughout the course of, like, life, we tend to lose track of ourselves. We tend to lose sight. We tend to, I love this word, we tend to drift. It's not like like a sense of, like, consciousness around it or intention. It's just that we tend to sort of get involved in the currents of our culture and our world and our lives and the busyness, and we just kind of tend to drift without awareness. And so what happens is, He searches for us that we might find ourselves. And in a nutshell, that's the history of the world. It's like a cosmic game of hide and seek constantly going on. And I I would say every generation, what we find is a God who refuses to give up on us, but who is in relentless search. In your worst moments, he still pursues. That's what we have in the garden. The first question that we find to Adam and to Eve isn't just for them, it's for us. It's the question that through the ages continues to cascade down, where are you? And Paul would say something like this, what can, in whatever drift we find ourselves in, what can separate us from the love of God? And here's his answer, nothing. I know you think drifting. I know you think hiding. I know you think running. I know you think whatever. I know you think you've separated yourself from God, but there is a sense of this God saying, there's actually nothing that can get in the way of my relentless search of you. I'm constantly after your heart. What we often call the great story Jesus tells is the prodigal son. But that's a mistitle. Because that's not actually how the story starts. The story is not about a prodigal son. The son is not the subject. Neither is the other son. 
The story of the prodigal son in verse 11 of Luke 15 starts this way. There was a man who had two sons, meaning the story is about the father, not the sons. The story is about what kind of father we're dealing with. I mean, we know it's so cliche. We know the journeys of the sons, but it's about the kind of heart that God has to search after those who have wandered. The story isn't about the lostness of the son. It's about the loving pursuit of the father. And in Luke 15, Jesus tells these three stories. It's, it's, it's pretty beautiful. It's a great meditation for this week if you're looking to delve back into the scriptures. Back to back to back, he tells three stories about what God is like. That the repetition, I think, implies that it's hard to believe it. It's like Jesus saying, let me tell you a story. And then let me tell you a, a, another story. And then let me tell you another story. And they have the same exact theme. In other words, there's this like, man who had like 100 sheep and he lost one. And so what did he do? He didn't sit around. He's like, well, it's a good thing I still have a majority. He's like, no, no, one's gone. I got to get that back. And he beelines out to find the lost sheep. And then there's this like woman who has this lost coin. And what does she do? She like cleans and cleans and cleans and relentlessly searches until this coin is found. And then there's this man who has a lost son and he eagerly waits for the son's return to embrace him once again. I found Jesus when I was 14. And some of our students who are 14 are on a retreat right now. Same age. And I'll tell you, as I've gotten older, I'm deeply aware that I was actually not the one searching for God. God has always been the one searching for me. He's always on a pursuit to find you. I didn't find him. God finds us, and he asks us this question, where are you? Maybe you're here, but but you've been running from God. And maybe you're sitting next to your spouse because maybe maybe they won't know because you're in church. But there's been a, a pretty big run from God for all sorts of reasons. Or maybe you're here and, and you felt distant from the heart of Jesus for quite some time. Or maybe you felt nothing for a long time. And I'd just say it's okay. If that's where you are, to name that is helpful. Because the reason God asks us, where are you? Is because he wants us to locate where we are. And we can't change what we won't name. There's this, uh, there's this feature called Find My Phone. Like, I lose my wallet, I lose my keys, I lose my phone, and it's like on a daily basis. It's crazy. I lost my wedding ring on the way here from Mepkin Abbey. That's how crazy it is. Like, I was driving on the way, I was like, it must have just slipped off, right? That's my life. And it drives my wife nuts. It's amazing how gracious she is. And so you have this, like, find my phone app that will locate where your lost possessions are. And I was just thinking about that this weekend as I was writing this. I was like, man, what if there was, like, a find my soul app? Like, that's really hard. Like, we hear these questions, like, where are you? It's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm here, I guess. Like, isn't that good enough, right? I'm here. But there's not, like, a button we can push. But here's what, I'll know. Here's what I suggest. There's, like, there's like the aler- these alerts we should pay attention to in our life. They help us to sort of name when we're hiding or running or numbing or phoning it in. And, and it's not like we're aware that we've been doing anything, these things. It's often like just below our level of awareness. And I'll just say like confessionally for me, I know I'm, I don't know where I am. Not like geographically, but like in my identity when I'm, when I'm busy. Like I know we hear that a lot, but I'll just say like often being hurried is a strategy so we don't have to sit with ourselves. Not all the time. I get it. Life throws demands at us, particularly those with youngins or those in, with exams or, you know, whatever life is throwing your way. But I will say often the busyness that I live is a brand of, of really choosing that to avoid actually sitting with 
hard questions. I think another way that I notice that I don't know where I am is I'm edgy. Like if I'm moody, what I notice is that that is usually about a thing underneath a thing underneath a thing. That Elena will get like an edgy AJ. And it's like to just pause and to realize like I, I, I'm not like in my best self right now. I'm, I'm not collected. I don't, I'm scattered. I'm not in a place where like joy happens or that I'm fully present. And like this mood thing, usually moods are not for nothing. Usually there's something going on that whatever happened here is really about what's going on here. But I don't want to look at what's going on here because I don't have time for that or I don't want to face that or I don't want to be serious about that. I just want to keep going. And that's how we drift. That's how we get to these places in our life where months later it's like, where are you? It's like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just phoning it in. The last thing I think we do is that we're, we're lonely. When I say lonely, I mean like you can come to a place in your life where you've realized you've purposefully isolated yourself. It's different than solitude. Solitude is about rest and renewal. Loneliness is about withdrawal and avoidance. Like if you're at a place in your life right now where just being with people is hard because you don't want to be phony or you don't want to be honest, it might mean that you're running from something. Not always. But often when I'm lonely, I find there's something in me that's not actually willing to face reality right now. Like this is a really big one, particularly among men, where, you know, we don't want anyone poking around, asking questions. We just want to keep going, leave me alone, that sort of dynamic. And, and most men, and I, I just say being one, most men wish they had just one friend that they could be honest with. And so that's why we've been talking about doing this thing called the Men's Collective, which is just like a, a way of talking about a container by which through fire pits and studies and retreats, like there's just various levels of engagement around here. Like we can do something together about loneliness for, for men and women. Like we can do something about that. It's like the pervasive epidemic of our age. And we as a church have been given power to step into relationship and to actually act in the midst of that. And so the question this morning, the question that we've seen from Genesis is where are you? Where are you? That's the conversation that God begins to pull us into, to notice and to ask. And so maybe it's wondering if there's some space that you can create this week to be intentional with that question. Where are you? Are you living the way you intend? Are you present to loved ones? Are you present with God? There's this thing Katie creates for us every week. It's these weekly scriptures, and it's out in the hall. In the lobby, it's just a way of saying, I, I want to show up and meditate on the story that God has been doing in the world. And those are there for the taking every week to say, I want to check in with a God who is constantly pursuing me. And so, friends, we begin this conversation toward Easter by just saying, welcome to Lent. It's a season of noticing. It's a season of pulling back and checking in with some of life's deepest questions that if we don't actually take the time to process, we'll just drift and just charge through life and get to the end of it and ask what it was all really about. In the great game, Hide and Seek, there's this really great phrase that the seeker says. Ready or not, here I come. God's a seeker, and he searches for us until we're found. I pray that you will let yourself be found by God this season.
because he loves you. And there's nothing you can do about that. Lord, we thank you for this morning and just for the sobriety of this season, for what you've called us to, to, um, to show up again with you. And Lord, just celebrate ways that um, so many in this community are intentional to notice. And Lord, for those of us that just tend to hide or to run or to numb, I pray that you would find us again this season and that we would be fully alive in you, that we would know you and we'd be known by you. So I pray that by the power of your spirit that you would move mightily amongst us, God. Awaken our hearts fully to search after the God who's already searching for us. In Jesus' name, amen. To be in your presence <clears throat> and to sit at your feet and where your love surrounds me and makes me. This is my desire, oh Lord, this is my desire, this is my desire, oh Lord, this is my desire. The Lord is here. So lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Paul would say, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this cup and you eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come upon these elements and make them for us spiritually the body and blood of Jesus, that we would know you, and that we would, feel, felt, we would feel felt, we would be felt, and we would feel found by you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are and for being present with us. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Friends, let's stand together and let's say the mystery of the faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. I just want to invite our communion service forward as we pray the prayer that Jesus invited us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come when you're ready and receive who God says you already are, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the cup of salvation. got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? And I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song
Ransom me, and like a flower. 
promised. The Lord has promised you to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion me. As long as life endures, my chains are gone. in our prayer wall and this week our staff and our prayer team will be praying about that for you and now as we leave may the practice of honest confession and the joy of radical forgiveness set you free this Lent thanks be to God